This is Statistically Insignificant, the podcast with slides that your school jocks warned you about. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be the biggest nerd in tonight's offerings. With me is Bart. How's it going? Hey, I'm good. Um, I go by he and him, and uh, since the last episode, I've inherited like $10,000, so I renounce all of my socialist beliefs, and I'm looking for a company that is very comfortable with using child labour to invest some money in. Oh, have you considered the wild and lucrative world of non-fungible tokens? Ooh, man, that, <laughs> that sounds like a... Uh interesting world that I should explore. I'm sure you can find some even more gullible rube to palm off whatever you purchase. Hell yeah. Or somebody who's willing to launder money through your pocket, in fact. Both both things can be true. (laughs) Yes, indeed. This episode is going to be a bit of a technical one. We will be talking about different ways of summarising data to tell us what we expect to see in a population. When you calculate an average, this is the sort of thing you're doing. You're giving a summary of where the population sits with regard to what you're measuring. Think average temperature of a city in winter or summer tells you the sort of weather you might expect to see or the sort of clothing you might need to wear. We are going to be talking about two types of summary statistic. The first is known as a measure of center, also called a location or an average. These are used to indicate where the typical measurement would be, which is why they're called those things like location. What do you mean by typical in that case? Well, we, I would call it an expectation, right? But what, what that means is when you go and you pull somebody out of the population or something or whatever it is you're measuring, and you take a measurement, you expect to see something reasonably close to the measure to your center. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, if you see something wildly different to your average, then if you, ha- if you have an average going, uh, going into it at least, then that's usually an indication that something's gone wrong with your measurement. Yeah. You may remember mean, median, and mode from school. They're in this type. So we're going to start with the mean. We've already seen this before in a couple of previous episodes. This is what you get when you add up the values from your observation and divide by how many observations there are. Let's say we have our first measurement, x1, plus our second measurement, plus our third, plus some number of other measurements, plus the last measurement, which we're going to call xn. Then this n indicates how many measurements we have, so then we divide by n. This is also called the arithmetic mean because you're adding stuff up. There's a version where you multiply, we'll do with that some other time. This division by the number of measurements makes each measurement equally important to the mean, but it also makes the mean inclined to get pulled around by values that are a long way from the rest of the data. So if we consider 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus something that's a long way away, say 14, there's 4 measurements, we divide by 4, which is 20 divided by 4, which is five. So this is higher than these three measurements because it's getting pulled upwards by the 14. Yes. We saw this in episode two when we talked about life expectancy. If you have a lot of people dying very young, it drags down the life expectancy of the general population from birth. Yes. Consider this in comparison to if we have say one plus two plus three plus four, which is divided by four, which is 10 divided by 4, which is 2.5. Looks more reasonable to what you'd see in the bottom part of that, right? Yes. Next, we have our median. It's a slightly different measure of center, which is less inclined to get displaced in that fashion. It's the value where half of the data is below and half is above. So I could write this as 50% of the data is below, 50% above. And that is a measure of center, is quite literally a measure of center because half your measurements are to either side. It's symmetric in that sense. Yes. So let's calculate our median for each of these. Now, we have four measurements, one, two, three, and 14. They're written in order because that makes things more convenient. So if we go to the middle, that's between two and three. So our median in the first case would be halfway between the two, which is 2.5. If we come down to the second, we still have four measurements. We still have the central two as two and three, and halfway between those is 2.5. So this median hasn't been changed 
by that extreme value, the 14 in the first case. Yes. Notice that because we have an even number of values, we get something between these two, between two and three. If we had an odd number of values, we would just take the middle one. So if we had just one, two, and three, two would be the central, the median. Yes. These examples show something interesting. You can get a value for your measure of center that you don't observe, or that might not even be possible. For example, in this case, we have 2.5 as the median, and here 2.5 as the mean. The numbers we're dealing with are whole numbers, so you might not be able to measure actually measure a 2.5, even though that might be the the central value that you take as your uh, average. And Pardon. so, what's the implication of that? It's this is a an element of paranoia, which is right. that it can be realistic for you to have a mean or a median which does, is not observable, but still represents the population as a summary statistic. Like if you're right. counting things, like let's say you're counting the number of kids in a family. 2.6 children might be your average number of kids, but you can't have a you know 60% of a kid. Not yet. Science <laughs> is working on it. <laughs> we can begin that dream. This isn't a problem, right? Because what you're really interested in from this is a summary statistic that you can use to compare observations across uh, different populations. And also, so you can eyeball something if you make a new measurement and say, does this seem realistic? Yes. Other uh, measures of location that you may have encountered are the maximum and the minimum. The max being the highest value that you see and the minimum being the lowest. These aren't really a measure of center, because they don't tell you what the center is. They're a measure of location, quite literally. They tell you where you don't get bigger or smaller than your, what you have observed. These stats rely on having a particular type of measurement, something that behaves like numbers do. That might be a number, or in the case of a median, it might be something that has ordering, like first place, second place, third place in a race. Those don't necessarily have an equal distance between them. Your first and second place may be a second apart, while third place may be 10 or 15 seconds behind. So you still have your ordering of first, second, and third, but they're not spaced equally. Yes. That is something you need to be a little bit careful about, but these sort of, these data types come into play when you start measuring things, basically. Not all data has ordering. Most things like music genres, suburbs, religion are categories that you can't use mean, median, or max or min to summarize. Instead, the typical tool is the mode, which tells you the most populated category, the category with the highest number of observations. I'm sure you're about to, but can you explain how that's related to what you said about um, like music genre or suburb or religion? Yep. So if you are looking at people, uh, if you're looking at the number of people in different suburbs, the suburb with the biggest number of people in it is the mode. The most popular music genre would be the mode. The religion with the most number of um, disciples, adherents, I'm not sure what the term for that would be, believers perhaps, would I be the mode the disciples for Disciples is a slightly uh, <laughs> charge. <radical>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Scholars for the Islamic. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's your measure of the biggest group by your categorization taxonomy. Yeah. Mode can also be used for numerical data, but we need to talk about how probability works for numbers first. If you have data which is whole numbers, one, two, 17, minus three, whatever, this is what we call discrete. As in, they are separated. You don't see values between those. And they won't snitch. <laughs> That's right. There's <laughs> gaps, right? So yeah. in that case, you can talk about the mode as the one of those values that's most likely. So if you have like one, two, and three as your possible values, one has a uh, 50% chance of happening, and each of these have, each of two and three have 25%, then one would be your mode because it is the most likely thing to happen. Yes. This is how we generally talk about probability with numbers when you have it that is discrete. This changes if you allow for what we call a continuous number. That means any value in some interval is possible. Think any number between 0 and 1, which is a few of them. 
so we have a different way of describing probability in this case. So I'm going to draw something like this. Okay, so if you've heard of the bell curve, not the god-awful uh, racist book, but this is, we'll call that, say there's zero, uh, this y-axis here, this is the probability. So the bell curve is the general shape of a, a family of different population distributions. They look kind of like this. They would look better if I could draw properly. But for the moment, just imagine that along this x-axis here, any number is possible. You could have zero, you could have minus three, you could have a rational or irrational number if those are familiar to you. So rational are things that can be written as fractions, irrational numbers are pi, square root of two, other friendly things like that. But yeah. you can move, you can have anything on this scale. So the probability of having any particular value, it turns out, is actually zero. Because the way that we work out probability in this sort of a situation is you do it proportional to the, the area under this curve here. So if I, say, want to know the probability of falling in this region here, what I do is I take this function, I calculate the area that's inside here, and that tells me the probability of falling in that range. Uh, if you are so inclined, this is using what we call integral calculus. It can become quickly very, very annoying to do when we use computers for it. So we're not actually going to deal with that. But the important thing to notice is that you can do this. That's how probability works. And the reason I want to talk about that is because you can talk about the most likely region as really you just eyeball the plot and say, oh, it's the top here. Stuff that is around this point is more likely to happen. Stuff out here, like if we think of this region in here, that's a much smaller area. That's a much smaller probability of happening. So right. the mode when we talk about continuous variables like this is the peak of the distribution, yes. which is this. I've drawn it to look a bit like a nipple. Sorry, not intentional, but it's this bit here. <laughs> Um, when you say zero is the most out, uh, most likely outcome, is well, that because... I would I would not say that zero is the most likely outcome because the probability of actually observing it is zero. Because if you think of like if you try to calculate the area under the curve above zero, that's a that's an infinitely thin line and it has area zero. Right. The way you okay. think about it instead is that. A region around zero has more is more likely to happen than the same like width of region around somewhere else. Yes. So, yeah. So if you imagine um, like this bit in here, right, and you think of that width, that's considerably more area than if we look at something of the same width over here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why uh, we think of it that way. It's so does just, that mean the, the left-hand side of the graph is negative numbers? In this case, like... yes, because zero is in the center here. Yeah, right. But this is not always true. Uh, this is just a special case that I've drawn here. Yeah. You can have um, continuous variables that can't be negative. So if you look at the size of something, you can't have a negative size. It starts at zero. It's not meaningful yeah. to talk about negative size. So you have a positive only distribution in that case yeah okay right yep furthermore as we will see later variables can have more than one mode if you are looking at categorical variables and your two largest groups have the same number of members both of them would be the mode if you're looking at continuous variables and we will come back to this later and you have something like this this would be a local mode it's not as high up as the one up here, but it is still higher than the areas around it. So we talk yes. about bimodal or multimodal data as those that have more than one particularly popular area. Right. All of these measures of location that we've seen come with a problem. Knowing where you expect to see observations doesn't tell you how far away from that point is reasonable. It might not be enough to compare different populations either. 
Consider these two cases. This is going to be a real trust test of my drawing ability. So in this first case, we have... Just pretend these lines go all the way out, right? But for the minute, I'm just going to draw that much. So we have two different distributions. The color indicates that they are different populations. They have roughly the same spread. So if you look at it, this width here is roughly the same as this width here. One is just further to the left than the other in terms of where it's generally located. Yeah? I think I think I get it, yeah. So uh, imagine if, if these are the mean, imagine that this had mean 10 and this had mean minus one. That's the sort of thing you might observe. This is very distinct from a different circumstance, which we'll draw down here, where you have, let's say the center's there, roughly, and you have something more spread out like this. So in this case, both they both have this central point here, right? So they would both have roughly the same mean at whatever value that is. But one's an awful lot more spread out than the other. Yes. That, and if you think about it, like if we think back to our um, probability as area under the curve, and think about the probability of being under here on this black line compared to the probability of being in the central region on this black line, you see a lot of things much further from that mean value on the black distribution than on the red distribution. Yes. We talk about this by describing the spread, quite literally from how spread out things are. Other terms are variance or scale, but spread makes the most sense to me. For most of the location statistics we mentioned above, there's an associated measure of spread, which is usually de defined in a similar way. So for our mean, the measure of spread is called the variance, which is calculated by measuring the distance between points and the mean. So if I have one measurement, let's say x1, I subtract off the mean, which might be like, say x1 is 0 and the mean is minus 5, right? Or, or the mean is 5. If I subtract off the mean, I get minus 5. So it's telling me that there's a distance of 5 units between these two. Yes. I then square this for reasons I'll explain in a second. And I do the same for all my other data. So this is the second measurement. I subtract off the mean. I square it. I add up the rest. Do the final one. I'm going to run out of space writing this. Squared. Okay. Then... If we have everyone in the population in this, we divide by the number of people in the population. If you just have a subset, like you've done a survey of a thousand people out of a population of a million or whatever, there's a slightly different uh, calculation, but we won't worry about it. The important thing to notice is that you are looking at the distance between the measurement you have observed and your measure of center. So if you think about it, if your mean is here, on the number line, let's say here, you have x1 over here. I'm interested in this gap. If yeah. I have x2 here, I've got a slightly smaller gap. So the number will be smaller. But I don't want these cancel out, right? Because x1, that's, not, that's meant to be x1, not xi. So let's see if I can move that. Okay. Because of how this is calculated, let's say the mean is zero, this is minus five. Minus five minus zero is a negative number. If this is three, three minus zero is a positive number. So if I don't square it, if I just go x1 minus mean plus x2 minus two minus the mean, I would get minus five plus three which is minus two. And that looks like a smaller variance than actually happens because these have kind of cancelled each other out based on what direction they're pointing in. Right. This is why we square the values. So we don't have negative numbers that make the variance look smaller than it actually is. Because if we get, if we remove this bit uh, and we square, this, which means multiply it by itself if uh, math is unfamiliar to you, this would be become minus 5 minus 0 squared plus 
3 minus 0 squared, which is minus 5 squared plus 3 squared, which is now a negative number times itself. A negative times a negative is a positive, which is really, really handy because this becomes 25. 3 squared is 9, so we get 34. Now we haven't divided by the number of measurements in here, but what, what's important is this is a much better reflection of the fact that your um, measurements are distant from the mean than that minus 3 was. Minus 2, yes. sorry. Yeah, and that's what you're trying to capture in this variance. The standard deviation is uh, another one associated with the mean. What you do to get the standard deviation is just you take the square root of variance. So standard deviation is equal to the square root of the variance. And you do this because having all of these squares means that the distances blow up, right? For a yes. distance of five, here, you've got 25 in your, when you add up the variance. And that makes it look potentially much larger than it actually is. Taking the square root can be a little bit easier to think about because then it looks more proportional to the actual scale of the numbers you're dealing with. So if we just took these two and we were going to calculate the variance, we would need to divide by n. So we would get 34 divided by 2, which is 17. So 17 is the variance for our two measurements here mm -hmm. and then the square root of 17 would be the standard deviation which I am going to calculate not in my head I'm not that big of a nerd okay which is the standard deviation which we usually shorten to be SD would be 4.12 approximately but there's a lot more decimal places after that but I'm not going to write them down sure so, so this sorry go on I was just going to say, so the standard deviation gives you the measure that is proportional to the original It's closer. Uh, graph, yeah. Right. Yeah, because if, if you look at this this 4.12 and you go and look at this, the kind of scale of this minus 5 and this 3, right? That's, they're, they're less than 10 away from 0. This is less than 10 away from 0. 17 is much bigger than either of them. Yes. And that's kind of, it can be a little more um, comprehensible to talk about standard deviation. At least I find it better to think about if I'm trying to eyeball data and um, just ask what's reasonable. Yes. So that variance or standard deviation is the measure of spread associated with the mean. So let's go back here and have a look at these. In this first example, we had these two are different means. But roughly the same measure of spread would be the case in here. One is not more dispersed than the other one. Yes. In this case down the bottom, uh, the red has less variance. And the black has much more variance. And if you think about it, um, the way you calculate variance in continuous distributions is slightly different to the sum that I showed you. I lied a little bit. Sorry. You have to use <laughs> calculus and I don't really want to explain calculus. So, uh, but you can think about this as there is, you are more, you get more distance between uh, your mean over here and the points that you are likely to see in the black case than you do in the red case when things are tighter. Next up, we'll talk about the median. Now, if you remember, the median was the point where half the data was smaller than it, half the data was larger than it. What we are interested in as a measure of spread for this is called the interquartile range. Quartile meaning quarter. So just as for the median, we split the data, we split the data between the quartiles and then we calculate the difference between them. The first quartile has 25% of the data below. 75% above. The second quartile is the median, actually. Yeah. So that's 50%, 50%. The third quartile has 75% below, 25% above. So between quarter one and quarter three, 
fifty percent of the data is in the middle there, and that's yeah. what the interquartile range gets at. So it's abbreviated. That's the word I was looking for before. IQR, and it is Q three minus Q one. Interquartile range being the difference between these two. Yes. Yep. Cool. Graphically, if we imagine this is our median. Here is Q three. And because this can be asymmetric, let's say here is Q1, then the interquartile range is between these two points here. And notice that the median always sits in the middle there. Yes. This represents the central 50% of the data. Because remember that we have 25% of the data is larger than the third quartile, and 25% of the data is smaller than the first quartile by yeah. these definitions up here. So this interquartile range really does give us a metric of where that central block of data is. In some distributions, if you are using mean and standard deviation, um, you can say that you expect some proportion of the standard of the data to be one or two standard deviations away from the mean. What that looks like is you have something like this, here's your mean, mm -hmm. and then here is mean plus one standard deviation, and here is mean minus one standard deviation. And so in this region between plus and minus one standard deviation, you can say, oh, I expect, say, 70% of my data to sit in here. There are particular distributions which let you do that, but that is the kind of comparison that you make between the um, mean and standard deviation that you can make rather more straightforwardly with the, the interquartile range here. Yeah, so the interquartile range never changes, but the standard deviation of the mean can. The amount of data contained in that interquartile range does not change, no. There are special distributions that give you roughly some proportion or that give you a usual proportion of the data within this interval. But yeah. you can calculate mean and standard deviation for a lot more distribution than that holds true for. You can calculate this for basically anything that's based on numbers, but there's only some special number of those for which you can describe this property straightforwardly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's handy, it's not always true. And this is part of why plotting your data is really important, because you can usually eyeball whether that would roughly happen based on whether it's like, based on the shape. Because if it's like this, it's more likely than if it's shaped like this, for example. Which yeah, is, right. yeah, very different sort of distribution. All right, now let's talk about the mode. For the mode, there isn't a... Um, universal way of defining spread because like spread kind of cares about distance and ordering and you don't necessarily have those things if you're dealing with the mode right for categorical variables but what yes. you can do is you can talk about the percentage of observations or population in the mode category and the number of categories oh i get it yes yep so it's the uh... Yeah, so it's if we the have... the actual amount that you've observed in that mode. Yeah, so imagine if we have two categories, if they're evenly split, 50%, 50%, then, well, let's, let's say we actually have a mode, so we're going to go uh, not quite 50%, let's say 49%, 51%, right? So B is the mode, it's got more percentage of it in it, but it only has about half, so you've got a, basically an even split among these. If you had three categories, roughly a third in each, same idea. This is one way of thinking about homogeneity of your population. If you have 10 categories and one of them has half your population in it, that would be, um, and that's the mode, then chances are you have your one big category, which is your mode, and a handful of smaller ones that represent smaller proportions of the population. That's a more kind of homogeneous situation in the sense that you have more in one group than if your population was evenly spread amongst your ten. Yes, and so that's where the uh, the example of population or religion or yeah um, 
yeah, music category or whatever. Yep. So if you, around. Yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So if you have well, you will have um some collection of things that is generally more popular than the rest, and you'll have some usually some stuff that's uh esoteric, perhaps, or unusual, which generally has fewer people in the population associated with it. Yeah. Yeah. So between these two things, your location and your measure of spread or um, variance or whatever, you can get an idea of what you expect to see in your general population and how dispersed it is, how far away from that central point is still a reasonable observation to have. This is particularly useful if you're looking for data entry errors where you get things that are like an order of magnitude bigger or smaller than most of the measurements because somebody stuffed up digit. It happens. In my research yeah. on tree size, we call these catastrophic errors because they're really large in comparison to the other sorts of errors that you get. And you might have a tree that jumps from like 10 centimeters in diameter one year to like 103 centimeters in diameter five years later. And what's actually happened is it's 13 centimeters. Somebody put an extra digit in. Yeah. We have all these different measures for a reason. I promise they're not just to confuse and annoy. We've already seen some of this with the fact that you need to use the mode for a categorical observation, you can't use a mean because they don't behave like numbers. In this case, you are choosing your statistic for the center and spread based on the type of data, but there are also features of the population itself which are important as well. When I introduced the median, I talked about how the mean gets pulled towards values that are a long way from the bulk of the data. This is a reflection of what we call an asymmetric or skewed distribution. So if on one end of our scale, with not no skew, we have something that's more or less symmetric, if I could draw properly. On the other end, we have something that's you know, very skewed like this, right? In the symmetric case, the mean and the median actually agree. Because if it is symmetric, then you would have 50% of your data to each side of this line. So you would have a mean and a median right in the center there. But if you do this for the skewed distribution, these really big values will pull your mean up while the median still sits lower. So if your median is about here, yeah, we'll say that's the median. I can't draw straight lines today, it's okay. Your mm -hmm. mean is going to get dragged up by these high values and might sit here or something. And that's why they say um, median is a better measure yeah. of income distribution, for example. Than yeah, mean. well, well, in, in general, if you have something that is skewed, your median is a better way of thinking about the center of the data for where the bulk of the population sits while the mean is more sensitive to those extreme values. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are doing data wrangling in the audience, this is also why you should plot your data so you can do a visual check on things like skewness. You can calculate skewness or you can look at it or do both. So as you mentioned, wealth, income and house prices both tend to behave like this, which is why you hear about median house prices in news articles. Which is in Sydney, where I live, is getting really stupid. It's over a million dollars is the median house price now. Oh my god. Oh, it's so bad. Well, I live in Melbourne, so it's not much it's, better here. <laughs> oh, you'll join us soon. <laughs> so this is a plot of the household net worth in Australia from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. This is the value of the assets that a household owns minus their debts. The data points here are 100,000 um, apart. 100,000 in value apart, which is why you get this like spike thing going on. So it looks a bit funny, but that just means that you've got a huge increase in the population between those points. So you have a very small percentage of your population at a really high net, net worth here. And most of your population uh, actually sits in this sort of range here. Yeah. In fact, the median for this data of net, uh, net worth for the most recent one, which is the 2017 to 2018, was five hundred and fifty-eight thousand nine hundred dollars, while the mean was smack bang on a million, roughly. <laughs> yeah, decimal places, blah blah blah. 
So these very, very wealthy people really, really do pull up the mean. And yeah, another thing sense. to be aware of when thinking about this is that for most of the people in this lower region here, let's say from that sort of region, the bulk of their net value is tied up in their home, the home that they actually live on. If you get higher than that, usually you have things like capital assets or investment properties or whatever else. And realistically, for a lot of those people, they don't have access to that money as money. It's sitting in an asset that they're not likely to sell in a hurry. So their net worth may or may not reflect their actual living conditions. Because if you live in a home that, due to Sydney's insane house price growth, is now worth like seven hundred or eight hundred dollars thousand dollars which is below the median but you don't have a steady income because you're a retiree who didn't have a huge amount of um superannuation so let's say your income from super whatever is like thirty thousand dollars a year you might actually not be able to um leverage that very well of course whether that person needs to stay in that property or be better off moving is a different sort of discussion to have but it is quite insane that we have this huge amount of capital value nominally tied up in people's houses treating them as assets when they actually need somewhere to live and they need to be able to live in it yes so another thing that can throw you off if you're using summary statistics uh to talk about a population without actually looking at it in detail is a uh, clustering of observations. These center and spread metrics may disguise the fact that you actually have a distribution that looks like this. So we've got a lot near this end and a lot near this end and not much in the middle. We call this a bimodal distribution, mode being a peak in this case, and we have two of them. We have one here and one here. So this is roughly symmetric so your mean and your median it would be more symmetric if i could draw uh, are <laughs> still about here but you'd have quite a high variance because basically everything is a long way from that central point and unless you plot it you might not realize that this is what's going on always plot your data this sort of extreme example isn't so common and usually if you see clustering, it's indicative of some population structure you're not aware of. Like maybe the um, animals you're taking measurements from actually, or plants or whatever, actually belong to two subspecies that haven't been identified yet. It does happen. Yeah. This particular case could show up if you decide to have a model of gender, which is a continuous scale between exclusively feminine and exclusively masculine. So if we put F down here, M here, you can imagine that male people would choose something at or close to this end, female people would choose something at or close to this other end, and then you'd have you know, those of us betwixt somewhere in the middle according to how we feel. Right. But so the thing is, right, with this, your average person in this model is non-binary. Now, I think that's perfectly fine it will cause <laughs> riots in the streets among the transphobes and the envyphobes to no end and thus should be used at every opportunity but it's also it's not a great representation of what people actually experience most people are binary that's not a problem that's just a description of what happens in the world so if you are going to present summary statistics for that population they should probably reflect that I was just going to ask, is, is a continuous scale of gender a particularly good way of measuring it anyway, though? That is case? very, very difficult to say. Um, I have a friend, one of my oldest friends, actually, who um, has done a bunch of research on gender experience, and we're going to talk to them at some point about what is reasonable to measure in gender. We've talked before about using discrete categories. That's what typically shows up in um, census data because it's easier to do. Yeah. Whereas this continuous model is one way of reflecting that there are shades of grey or shades of pink, perhaps, or purple, or whatever you'd like, between these two ends that could well reflect some amount of androgyny amongst those who consider themselves male or female, or the, the huge variety of non-binary experiences that exist. There are yeah. other ways to do this that may be better, and we will talk about those 
in an episode with my friend when we talk about um, different ways of modeling gender with uh, mathematical objects. But for the moment, this is one possibility which has more uh, richness to it than just like discrete categories. Yes, that makes sense. There is a different kind of necessary paranoia when using summary statistics to talk about a population, because the reality is, most of the time you're not going to actually observe the average. Pick a person out of a crowd, and they're almost certain to have a handful of features of their life history or identity which are not average, whatever average you look at for that measurement. And the more factors you consider, the more variables, the more likely it is that at least one thing will be unusual. There are also very real problems with describing populations of people with summary statistics, as it has an annoying tendency to reinforce stereotypes and erase minority groups. One possible demonstration of this is a Triple J segment from 2016, which ran on the day of the census that year. For the international audience, Triple J is a casual radio station run by the National Broadcaster. I think it's considered like a drive radio or something. I'm not really familiar with radio genres. It would be considered youth radio. Because oh, they, okay. Yeah. Their, their um, demographics are teenagers and slightly older than teenagers is who they are aiming for. Oh, that explains the... Uh, <laughs> I actually went and listened to the episode that this was... Or well, the um, archived recording that this was in. It was very like... I don't know. It's It seemed kind of odd to me to listen to. I was expecting air horns, but they didn't use air horns. So, you know... That's the sort of vibe. Anyway, in this particular instance, they ran a call-in competition to find the most average Australian. So they (laughs) listed a bunch of characteristics which were average to an Australian resident according to the previous census in 2011 and asked listeners to call in if they were described by them. The full list is pretty long, but I'm going to write out the main ones. So the first one we had was sex. And uh, check out episode three for discussion of why I call this sex and not gender. And the person would be female. We have age. They would be 37. We have marital status, which is married to a guy. I don't think in the 2011 census they... Because, I mean, same-sex marriage wasn't even legal then. So they didn't really look at same-sex marriages. Number of kids and their age. Oh, and their sex. Which was uh, six and nine. A boy and a girl. They have type of housing, which was detached, three-bedroom. They had a housing cost which in this case is uh, 1800 month mortgage. Sounds like fascinating radio. <laughs> I'm sure it's every bit as fascinating as this podcast. <laughs> they had primary employment. They didn't mention the variable names. They just basically listed off the characteristics. Yeah, right. Um, so this was for the person themselves, and they were sales assistant, working 32 hours per week. A religion, Catholic, a place of birth and ancestry. So they were born in Australia, but they have uh, English... Irish or Scottish ancestry. So their parents were, uh, were born in Australia, but come from originally family line came back from there. Lastly, hours of housework, which was more than five per week. Let's have a think about these. I'm going to mark with red the ones that were mean, right? So age, this would be a mean because it's the average number of years. The number of kids, which was two, and their ages would be means. Uh, notice that they didn't actually have fractions of kids. This is because they were looking for an actual person, although the actual average number of kids is probably some sort of um, decimal, like 0.6 or something. Yeah. The uh, three bedrooms, similar deal. This would have been a mean, but probably didn't have like fractional house, uh, fractional um, rooms. This would have been some sort of a mean, but it may have been a mean, but it may have actually been like... A bracket. So if you say your mortgage is between like eighteen hundred and two thousand dollars a month, that may have been how the question got set up. This thirty two hours a week would have also been an average. Mm-hmm. And this hours of housework was probably um because the way that the ABS asks about hours of housework is it says like less than five hours, five to ten, ten to fifteen, fifteen plus, that sort of thing. Yeah. So this would not have been a mean so much as probably like just looking at what of those were um, more common to happen. The so rest, mode. well, because it's greater than five, it probably wasn't a mode because you had other categories above five. So oh, I'm okay. not sure why they chose that one. But So everything else, the sex, marital status, the types of things, those would all be modes. Those are categorical variables. Yeah. So what problems are there here? Well, they're 
did include the mortgage cost. They didn't actually ask about income. Australians have adopted some of the American hesitation to talk about wealth, not among the obscenely rich, of course. So it would have been considered rude for the radio presenters to include that, like asking somebody how much they earn on national radio. Probably not a great idea. As it is, the people who did call up were cagey even to talk about how much they paid in mortgage. So you heard, like, there were three or four people, and you heard a lot of, oh, slightly more than that, which could mean anything from, like, $1,900, $2,000 a month to $2,500 a month. This is absolutely something that gets leveraged by capitalists to discourage worker solidarity, and you should all resist it as much as possible, particularly with your co-workers. Aside from continuing that particular trend, this sort of thing can encourage a perception of what makes someone Australian or un-Australian. Like, in particular, this, this place of birth and this ancestry thing. What this means is that this person is white and that they were born in Australia. And there's plenty of anti-people like people of colour and anti-immigrant sentiment here, less towards people who come from the British Isles. Although, have you met them? Uh, i uh i have a british passport although i wasn't (laughs) born there i was imported from new zealand instead so this particular image of australia as a country of white people is very much a consequence of stuff like this i mean they they had a statistician on there somebody somebody who was actually involved in running the census who was talking about the limitations of describing the population in terms of these averages but you see a lot of this What's the average Australian? That discourse is all through our politics. Probably doesn't look exactly like this person. For one thing, they're female, and most of the uh, average Australian talk is very blokey, let's say. But the idea that they are married, they're a homeowner, they have a couple of kids, they live in an urban environment, that they probably work for somebody, uh, despite the fact that most of our government rhetoric is based around people who are self-employed or small business owners or big business owners. So and this is a political reason. For oh, absolutely, right. <laughs> it's cuz they're the party of capital. So all of this goes towards presenting a particular image of the average Australian when the reality is that Australia is getting increasingly diverse. The proportion of people in that mode category across these different variables is generally shrinking. There are more categories showing up. Like in episode three, we talked about this sex statistic. Now you can actually be registered by the ABS in the census as a non-binary sex, which is horrendous way of putting it. Go see that episode if you want me ranting about that some more. So that means you have people who are in a new category for this variable that did not exist before. In marital status, now pretty much always in the most recent census, at least, census? What's the plural for that? Oh. Okay. So it's probably said Seuss, actually, <laughs> because Latin's weird. Uh, but in, in recent years, you could have married, you could have single, you could have de facto partner. Um, so there is, has been a bigger category of things that could go on there. Widowed, another one, of course. New religions showing up, or fewer people being in the dominant religions and the growth of people without religion at all. Mm. These things all point towards a trend of diversity that... This model of average, which talks n- not at all about diversity, like there's no, qu- there's no metric here of variance in any one of these, that misses this entire way of talking about how you summarize these statistics. Absolutely. Because in some respect, talking about the spread, a bit more tactical, a bit more difficult if you're just trying to do like a casual radio show. If you're sufficiently nerdy and have a podcast about it, on the other hand, you can get a lot of content out of this. <laughs> you can go all the way down the rabbit hole. Exactly. Um, I think it's socially, uh, like sociologically interesting in terms of like, for example, religion, Catholicism, consider- mm. like uh, as compared to England, which is the kind of mythological white Yeah, the Anglos, there, like. Anglicans and things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that doesn't mean it's particularly useful to talk about in... Yeah, well, what's interesting like to me an is... Actual, I th- as an average of a person. Yeah, well, I, this, is prob- this was probably at the time the most populous religion, right? I think these days it's no religion. Uh, you know, pending the, um, pending the outcome of the census that happened this year, at least. Yes. So with the uh, particularly nerdy stuff out of the way, let's go on to the mailbag segment. 
For our mailbag today, we're going to be looking at a chart that the Australian paper put up on Twitter. I got like half a dozen people send me this because they knew it would make me mad. Uh, yeah. So it's from October 3rd this year. The tweet has now been deleted, although I will still put a link in the references, which means you know it's real proper quality. <laughs> so this chart was of the results of a preferred Prime Minister survey done by a news poll for The Australian. And here it is. Now, this is not the most egregious example of a pie chart that I have seen. Like an awful lot of stats nerds, I have a dislike for them as a, as a generally a poor way of representing data because people aren't very good at looking at something like this and thinking about proportion. But this is pretty bad. For the audio-only crew, the circle is divided into two parts, one for Scott Morrison, one for Anthony Albanese. Morrison is at 47% preferred prime minister, with no change. The actual question was, would who would make a better prime minister? Albanese is at 31, sorry, at 34%, with a minus 1% change. There is no error margin given. Now, the eagle-eyed among you may have spotted that, hang on, pie charts generally represent 100% in total, but 47 plus 34 is 81%, not 100%. So there's a whole section missing. In fact, 19% is missing from this chart. The way it's drawn here, it looks like Scott Morrison has more than half of the responses are saying he's the better prime minister, but 47% is not more than half, right? Slightly misleading. If you do exclude the missing 19%, the proportions of what's drawn here is accurate. Morrison has slightly more than half of 81%. Albanese has slightly less than half of 81%. But if you do include that 19%, here's what you get instead. So now, for the audio only, we have Morrison at 47, Albanese at 34, and other, or possibly none, because I don't know what they actually asked. The article was paywall, and I'm not giving them money. Well, also, I've been um, polled before, and... They, d they didn't really ask you which of these would you prefer. They, mm. they tend to ask you, like, like do you approve of, strongly I think approve? Um, yeah, I think that's a slightly approve. different question. So yeah, okay, right. approval rating is separate to preferred prime minister. Ah, and, okay, yes. Yeah, yes. and this one, uh, this so this question here, uh, if they are being honest, which they probably are in that at least, that's the question that they asked. Who would make a better prime minister? But if we come back to this uh, pie chart that includes this 19% other over here, suddenly it doesn't look quite so good for either Scott Morris or Anthony Albanese. It looks like there's this massive wedge, nearly 20% of the population, who think both of them kind of suck. I can't imagine why. <laughs> oh, makes no sense to me. Yeah, I, I mean, given... Anthony Albanese is basically a non-entity and Scott Morrison has been hiding like a coward he is for 18 <laughs> months or more. Yeah, I can't imagine. So, yeah, the uh, the Australian apparently realised their, their error and deleted the tweet. I don't know if they put up another one. I'm not actually on Twitter, which the uh, if you pay any attention to the Twitter feed where only episodes get posted, might have given you a hint to that. And in general, these pie charts, they're difficult to read because unless you have these numbers in place, like... I could have produced this without the actual values there quite easily. I could squint at that and go, oh, that's that's a bit less than a half in this blue region. It's a bit, I don't know what's going on here. That looks like about a third and that's whatever's left in the, in the other. But mm. that's very hard to interpret. I would use something like a bar chart instead. Anyway, yeah, that's us done for the day. Thank you very much, Bart. No, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. See you then. Bye.